Hello friends. In this video, I'll be focusing on the applications of Newton's three laws of motion. Actually, this is already the second part of my discussion on Newton's three laws of motion. But this time around, I'll be focusing more on uh, problems that are considered not so easy. And these are just concentrated on linear motion. Here is problem number one. A 1,580 kilogram car is traveling with a speed of 15.0 meters per second. What is the magnitude of the horizontal net force that is required to bring the car to a halt, meaning to a stop, in a distance of 50.0 meters? So obviously, this problem requires us to apply Newton's second law of motion. For our uh, given data, we have the mass of the car, which is 1,580 kilograms. We also have the initial velocity or speed of the car, which is 15.0 meters per second. And the final speed of the car is assumed to be zero because it's going to stop after traveling a distance of 50.0 meters. So, the distance traveled by the car before coming to a stop is also given that is equal to 50.0 meters. And we are asked to find the net force but before we can find the net force acting on the car, we first determine the acceleration. And that is using the formula. Acceleration A is equal to quantity V squared minus V naught squared all over twice the distance D. So substituting the given, we have our initial or final velocity speed is zero, okay? Minus the square of the initial speed or 15.0 meter per second, square that, then divide the whole thing by two quantity 50.0 meters, okay? And simplifying, we get this answer for the acceleration, which is negative 2.25 meters per second squared. It is expected that the acceleration is indeed negative because it has to slow down or decelerate, hence the negative sign is uh, required. Now, we can already determine the net force using the formula F net is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So substituting, the mass is 1,580 kilogram. Multiply that by the computed acceleration or negative 2.25 meters per second squared. So our uh, answer therefore is equal to the net force which is 300 or 3.56 raised to the third power Newton. Okay? So our answer is rounded to three significant figures. This is the answer to the question. Uh, there is no need to include the negative sign anymore because the question is only asking for the magnitude of the horizontal net force. Okay? This is our final answer, 3.5. 56 times 10 to the third power Newton.
This is problem number two. A force P pulls on a crate of mass M on a rough surface as shown in this figure. The magnitudes and directions of the forces that act on the crate in this situation, we have the following. W represents the weight of the crate, right? So the weight of the crate is equal to 196 newtons. Its direction, of course, is along the negative y axis or simply directed downward. We also have F sub n, which represents the normal force on the crate. So that is the force exerted by the surface on the crate and its direction is vertically upward or to the positive y-axis. And horizontally, we have the force exerted by friction and that is labeled small f, whose magnitude is equal to 80 newtons. Okay, since the applied force P all right, is as shown, it makes an angle 60 degrees with the horizontal. So this applied force P has a horizontal component, which is directly uh, in the eastward direction or to the right. All right, and naturally, because there is a force exerted to the right on the crate, there must be an opposing force of friction. In this case, it is directed to the left. And that's exactly the meaning of small f, whose magnitude is 80 newtons. That is the opposing force. Opposing meaning it tends to uh, what we call counteract okay? the component of the applied force P along the x-axis. So, our first question, letter E, what is the magnitude of the normal force Fn? Okay. And for question letter B, okay, describe the motion of the crate. So, what's going to be uh, the, the type of motion that the crate will have as a result of all these forces acting on the crate all at the same time. So, for our solution, we first determine the x component of the applied force P. We label that as Px. Right? And our formula for that is Px equals cosine of the angle 60 degrees multiplied by the force P. Okay? It is cosine because we are interested in expressing the uh, adjacent side of the imaginary triangle that is formed by the force P. Okay? Uh, the unknown component force Px. Okay? And the unknown uh, vertical component which we also label as P Y. All right. So according to uh, our concept in trigonometry, okay, the adjacent side, when it is divided, okay, by the uh, hypotenuse, which is the P, we are defining cosine of the angle 60 degrees. All right. Now, uh, since we are given the value for the force P, we just multiply the cosine value of 60 degrees, which is 0 0.50, so times the given value for P, which is 160 newtons, and therefore the x component of Px, okay, the x component of P, labeled Px, is equal to 80 newtons, and this is directed to the right. So the positive sign implies that its direction is to the right or eastward.
Also, for the y component, okay, the formula is sine 60 degrees, also multiplied by the force P. And the sine of 60 degrees is uh, to the th three significant figures, we have 0 0.866, multiply that by the value of P, which is 160 newtons. Therefore, the y component is positive 100. 39 newtons, All right? Meaning the y component of the force P is directed to the positive y axis or vertically upward. So we can now determine, all right, uh, the normal force Fn using the uh, idea that the summation of all the vertical forces must be equal to zero. So we label that as the summation of Fy, all right, uh, which consists of three uh, forces, such as the F normal, whose direction is upward, plus okay, the weight W, whose direction is downward, and uh, the force, the y component of the force. P, which is labeled as PY. So when all of these three forces are added vectorially, all right, their sum must be equal to zero. And that means we can determine, okay, the magnitude of the force F normal simply by subtracting the weight W minus the value for the Y component PY. And that will give us Okay, when substituted, 196 newtons is the weight minus 139 newtons, the value of PY, and therefore our uh, value for the normal force F sub N is equal to 57 newtons. All right, that is the magnitude of the normal force exerted by the surface on the crate. And if you notice, earlier, uh, the force of friction that is directed to the left, whose magnitude is 80 newtons, is just equal to the x component of the force P, which is positive 80 newtons. So we say that the summation of the two forces acting along the x-axis, or summation of Fx, must be equal to zero. That simply implies that it's either that the crate is not moving or at rest or could be that the crate is moving but it is moving with constant velocity so our answer to a uh, question letter b is uh, if the crate okay has already started to move all right then it follows that its velocity must be equal to zero. The fact that the summation of all the forces acting on it, okay, summation of Fx equals zero, and the summation of Fy is equal to zero, then it is safe to say that the crate is moving with constant velocity. But it, the crate has not actually started to move at all, then we can consider uh, the crate to be at rest and that the force of friction uh, acting on the crate is just what we call static friction. Question number three. A 250 newton force is directed horizontally as shown in the diagram to push a 29 kilogram box up an inclined plane at a constant speed. Question is, determine the magnitude of the normal force F sub n and the coefficient of kinetic friction nu k. So for our solution, we first identify uh, 
in our vector diagram, okay, we will identify the forces acting on the box. Okay, so we define the x and y component uh, axis. Okay, this uh, vertical or slightly tilted uh, broken line is labeled as um, the y-axis and that is perpendicular to the surface of the inclined plane while the axis that is along the uh, surface of the incline is assumed to be the x-axis all right so we also include the representation for the box which is the block uh, dot okay so the forces acting on the box we have first the applied force f okay uh, we have the direction of the force f is as shown in our original diagram is directed in that direction uh, making an angle of 27 degrees with our defined x-axis right so this force f therefore has two components the x and the y components the red arrow represents its x component all right and it's directed up the plane while the y component of f labeled as fy is directed along the negative y axis we also have uh, the force of gravity or the weight of the box labeled as w represented here by the blue arrow all right so the weight of the box w or also equal to mg also has its y and x components okay the y component as shown is labeled w sub y okay uh, it is directed uh, along the negative y axis while the x component of w is directed down the inclined plane all right and it's labeled by the yellow arrow labeled wx by the way that angle between the vector arrow w and the vector arrow wy is also equal to 27 degrees now uh, the force of kinetic friction k or fk is directed down the plane it's represented by the blue arrow okay why down the plane it is because uh, as a result of the applied force f Okay, the tendency for the box is to move up the plane. All right? And uh, the force Fx, which is directed up the plane, is the one that is being opposed by the kinetic friction Fk. So it's logical to say that the kinetic friction must be opposite to the Fx. Okay? Since Fx is directed up the plane, the kinetic friction must be opposite to that and that is down the plane and last but not the least we have the force of the surface of the inclined okay labeled as f sub n or the normal force it is directed to the positive y axis and that f normal is what is being asked in the question we want to know the magnitude of that normal force x sub n so we begin by uh, considering okay uh, the fact that the summation of all the x component the forces along the x component along the x okay we label that as summation of fx that must be equal to zero okay so that we will satisfy the condition that uh, the box which according to the problem is moving with a constant speed up the plane so for that to be satisfied we say that the summation of fx must be equal to zero and that also means that the vector sum of all the forces acting along the x-axis when added victorially must be equal to zero and what are they 
we have the force Fx, which is directed up the plane, and the kinetic friction F sub k, which is directed down the plane, hence it is negative. And the component of the weight W labeled as Wx, which is also directed down the plane, hence it is also negative. Now for uh, the vertical components of the forces, we also say that uh, the summation of Fy must be also equal to zero. The fact that the crate or the box stays at rest vertically speaking. And with well, the forces acting along the Y, we have the force normal or F sub N, which is directed in the positive Y direction. And what else? We also have the Y component, the force F, labeled as Fy, which is directed in the negative Y direction, hence it is negative. And um, the component of the weight labeled as WY, which is also in the negative Y direction, therefore it is also uh, negative. When added vectorially, they also must be equal to zero. So, our next uh, step is to now determine the x component of the force F or Fx. All right, since we are given the value of F, which is 250 newtons, and the cosine of the angle 27 degrees, all right, that value is 0 0.89. We use cosine because Fx happens to be the adjacent side, okay, it's the adjacent side of the imaginary triangle where the angle being considered is 27 degrees. So, using our cycle, we will determine that the value of Fx is equal to 2.2 times 10 to the second power Newton, while the y component, okay, which is computed by multiplying the force F by the sine value of the angle 27 degrees, all right, or 250 newtons multiplied by 0 0.45, which is the sine value of 27 degrees. So we will get, as the magnitude of Fy, which is 1.1 times 10 to the second power Newton. Likewise, we also have to determine the weight W, which is just equal to mg. All right, the mass is 20, 29 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared. So the weight W is therefore equal to 2.8 times 10 to the second power Newton. All right, so that would allow us to determine now the X component of the weight W or W sub X. We just multiply the weight W by the sine of 27 degrees. All right. We are referring to that angle there uh, formed between the vector W and the vector WY. That must also be equal to 27 degrees uh, by definition of similar triangles. So, uh, calculating for WX, we will get the value 1.3 times 10 to the second power Newton. Likewise, for its y component, right, y dub, uh, wy okay, can be calculated multi by multiplying the weight w and the cosine of the angle 27 degrees. So, using your cycle again, we will get the value 2.5 times 10 to the second power Newton as the y component of the weight. Okay, we call it the wy. So, we now proceed in determination of the normal force Fn, okay? From our equation that the summation of Fy, okay, is equal to F normal minus Fy minus Wy equated to zero, we use that, okay, by transposing F normal, right? We will get the working formula for F normal, which is equal to Fy plus W, y. So, substituting the values of Fy, which is 1.1, 1 
raised to the second power newton and that of uh, wy which is 2.5 times 10 to the second power newton we will get the magnitude of the normal force f sub n equal to 3.6 times 10 to the second power newton so that answers our first question okay the value for of the magnitude of the normal force Fn. All right. So to determine the coefficient of kinetic friction mu k, we first uh, calculate for the kinetic friction Fk. Okay. From our equation of summation of Fx over here, summation of Fx which is equal to Fx minus Fk minus Wx. Okay, equals zero. We can isolate. Uh, Fk and get that working formula Fk is equal to F sub x minus Wx substituting the values of these two quantities 2.2 times 10 to the second power Newton for Fx minus the value for Wx which is 1.3 times 10 to the second power Newton we get okay, the magnitude of the kinetic friction Fk equals 0 0.9 times 10 to the second power Newton. We need that in order to find the coefficient of kinetic friction mu k. So mu k is just equal to the value of Fk or the kinetic friction divided by the normal force Fn. So substituting uh, 0. 9 times 10 to the second power newton the value of fk divided by 3.6 to the second power newton that's the value of the normal force so our answer for mu k or mu sub k the coefficient kinetic friction is equal to 0 0.3 all right so we are done in answering this uh, problem number three okay the normal force is equal to 3.6 times 10 to the second power newton or 360 newtons while the kinetic coefficient of kinetic friction mu sub k is equal to 0 Problem number four, a 20.0 kilogram crate is at rest on the floor. The mu s and mu k are coefficient of static and coefficient of kinetic frictions between the crate and the floor are 0 0.70 and 0 0.60 respectively. A horizontal force P is applied on the crate. Question letter A. Find the force of friction if letter A, the applied force P is equal to 20 newtons. Letter B, the applied force P is equal to 30 newtons. Letter C, the applied force P is equal to 120 newtons. Letter D, the applied force P is equal to 140 newtons. And letter E, the applied force P is equal to 180 newtons. Alright, so for the second Main question, letter B, what is the acceleration of the crate, if there is any, once it has been set into motion? Okay, We will let the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity G equal to 9.80 meter per second squared. So our solution, okay, we first determine that the normal force F sub N okay, is just equal to the mass times acceleration due to gravity, right? And that is equal to 196 newtons. That's exactly the weight of the 20.0 kilogram crate. Since the applied force is understood to be directed horizontally, no, uh, what do you call, no y component, Hence, 
the weight of the crate is just equal to the magnitude of the normal force, that is 196 newtons. So since we're given the coefficient of static friction, mu s, we can determine what the maximum static friction would be between the crate and the uh, surface of the floor. That is, fs max is equal to mu s multiplied by f normal. Substituting, we have 0 0.70 multiplied by 196 newtons. So the maximum static friction that is possible in this scenario is equal to 1.4 times 10 to the second power newton. While okay, the value for the kinetic friction between the floor and the crate is determined using the formula mu k multiplied by f normal or 0 0.60 times the normal force of 196 newtons. So we will get the fk value which is 1.2 times 10 to the second power newton. We now answer our first question, uh, small letter a. Okay. We are asked actually to find the force of friction if the applied force P given is 20 newtons. So our analysis is that when you apply a force P equals 20 newtons, all right, it is not enough to overcome the maximum static friction, which we earlier computed to be 1.4 times 10 to the second power newton or 140 newtons. Since the applied force P is only 20 newtons, that is uh, way, way below the maximum static friction. But in that situation, while this force P of 20 newtons is being applied on the crate, okay, but the crate doesn't move at all, so we say that the static friction must also be equal to the applied force P, okay, to satisfy the equation that the summation of Fx on the crate must be equal to zero because it still stays at rest. So our answer to letter A is Fs is equal to 20 newtons. For letter B, what if the force applied is 30 newtons? Again, that force applied 30 newtons is still way below the maximum static friction. Hence, okay, to satisfy that the summation of Fx on the crate must also be equal to zero, therefore our answer is Fs is also equal to 30 newtons. Same explanation as we had in letter A. For letter C, if the force P is now increased to 120 newtons, but then again, 120 newtons is still lower than the maximum static friction of 140 newtons. Therefore, our answer, just like in letter A and B, same explanation, okay, that the force of static friction must just be equal to the applied force P. Okay? To satisfy that the summation of Fx on the crate must also be equal to zero because it is still in equilibrium or at rest. Moving on to uh, the next question. Right? Uh, letter D, if the force now is increased to 140 newtons, notice that the applied force is now exactly equal to the magnitude of the maximum static friction, which is 140 newtons. But if the applied force P is just equal to the uh, static friction, then the crate somehow will still remain at rest. And therefore, it is still in equilibrium. Hence, the static friction that's being asked must also be equal to the applied force P of 140 newtons. By the way, if you notice, uh, there is a dot after the digit 0, 140 dot okay, newton. This is to emphasize that our answer, or even the, the given force P, okay, that we are emphasizing uh, 
the accuracy of the value, meaning this value, Fs equals 140 point Newton, has three significant digits. Okay. That's the meaning of the dot or the point after the last decimal place. Now, for letter E, if the force applied P is now increased to an amount of 180 newtons, all right, then uh, it is now greater than the maximum static friction, which is only 140 newtons. Hence, okay, the crate will be able to start moving. But while moving, it is now experiencing kinetic friction as the opposing force. But the kinetic friction available is only uh, 120 newtons. Hence, the answer to this question, letter E, the force of friction is just equal to the maximum or the possible kinetic friction, which is 120 newtons, even if the applied force is maintained at 180 newtons. All right? Uh, what will happen now to the crate if the applied force is 180 newtons and the force of friction is only 120 newtons? We say that there is a net force acting on the crate along the x axis, and that is F net is just the difference between the applied force and the kinetic friction. Okay? So this net force is equated to mass times the acceleration. Since in question letter B, we are to determine um, the acceleration of the crate as a result of the net force that results uh, due to the fact that the applied force is much greater than the uh, opposing kinetic friction. Okay? So, in our equation to determine uh, the net force, we have 180 newtons minus 120 newtons equated to the product of the mass 20.0 kilogram and the unknown value for acceleration A. So, isolating this equation for us to determine the value of A, we have the working equation for A, which is equal to the net force which is 60 newtons with two significant digits. Okay, That is the result of getting the difference between 180 minus 120 newtons. And dividing this net force by the mass of 20.0 kilogram, then we will get the value for the acceleration, which is equal to 3.0 meter per second squared, uh, rounded, to two significant digits. So this is the answer to question letter B. Problem number five. A 1,130 kilogram car is held in place by a light cable on a very smooth frictionless ramp as shown in the diagram. The cable makes an angle of 31.0 degrees above the surface of the ramp and the ramp itself rises at 25.0 degrees above the horizontal. Question letter E. Find the tension in the cable and letter B. How hard does the surface of the ramp push on the car. Let the magnitude of acceleration due to gravity be equal to 9.80 meter per second squared. Alright, so examining our diagram, we already have the forces identified. Okay. Uh, first, we have the uh, force capital T, which is the force exerted by the cable. Okay, on the object represented here by that dot. All right. So the force exerted by the cable on the car 
makes an angle of 31.0 degrees with the surface of the ramp. All right? So naturally, it will have the component Tx, which is directed uh, along the ramp, okay, along the ramp, but directed, of course, up the incline. And the uh, y component, of course, is directed uh, directed perpendicular, upward perpendicular to the surface of the inclined plane. So we label it here as T of y. Of course, we have the weight of the car, uh, w, all right? And the component of that weight of the car, wy. So wy is directed. Um, perpendicular also vertically but downward um, along the defined y-axis. We define this as our y-axis while the x-axis is along the uh, surface of the ramp. All right. So if the ramp itself makes an angle of 25 degrees, 25.0 above the horizontal, Okay. By definition of similar triangles, this angle that is formed between the weight W and the Y component WY must also be equal to 25.0 degrees. All right. So for our solution, detailed solution of finding the tension T and also uh, the force F normal, all right, we will look at the solutions in the next slide. So for our solution, okay, we determine the value of the weight W is equal to mg. Okay, the mass of the car is 1,130 kilogram. Multiply that by the value of G, 9.80 meter per second squared. So the weight of the car, okay, rounded to three significant figures, is equal to 1.11 raised to the fourth power Newton. And we determine the X component of the weight using the formula WX is equal to W sine of the angle 25 degrees. Substituting, we have 1.11 times 10 to the fourth Newton multiplied by the sine value of 25 degrees, which is 0 0.423. And we get, as the X component of the weight W in our earlier diagram that was supposed to be uh, directed down the ramp. All right? So you may check on that in our vector diagram. So that value of Wx is equal to 4.70 times 10 to the third power Newton. Likewise, the y component of the weight w, y, Wy is equal to W multiplied by the cosine value of the 25 degree angle, meaning 1.11 times 10 to the fourth Newton multiplied by 0 0.906. And we get... Uh, the y component of the weight equals 0, uh, 1.01 times 10 to the fourth power Newton. We also determine the x component of the tension T. All right. So we express that as Tx equals T cosine of the angle 31.0 degrees. So uh, since we still don't know the value of the tension T. We just let Tx be equal to uh, capital T multiplied by 0 0.857. And for Ty, all right, that's uh, also equal to capital T multiplied by the sine value of 31.0 degrees. So we just let Ty be equal to the unknown value for T multiplied by 0 0.515. And the fact that uh, 
the x component tx this is the component of the tension t okay and that is directed up the plane okay uh, for the car to remain in equilibrium static equilibrium that has to be equal to the x component of the weight w so tx must be equal to wx in short tx is also equal to 4.70 times 10 to the third power newton all right that is uh, using the concept of summation of fx must be equal to zero and we now have the solution for our first question which is finding the value of the tension of the cable capital T right so capital T uh, from what we have here Tx is equal to capital T multiplied by 0 0.857 we can now calculate T which is equal to Tx the fact that we now know what Tx is which is 4.70 times 10 to the third Newton divided by the value 0 0.857 and our answer would be force capital T is equal to 5.48 times 10 to the third power Newton okay rounded to three significant figures this is our answer to the first question the value for the tension of the cable exerted on the car All right so we also identify the magnitude of the y component of the tension t now that we know the value of t so using that relationship ty is equal to capital t multiplied by 0 0.515 right or 5.48 times 10 to the third power newton which is the value of the computed t multiplied that by 0 0.515 we will get as the value of ty 2.82 raised to the third power newton all right and to answer the sec the second question which is uh, in fact okay finding the value of the normal force okay the normal force is what is meant by question letter b how hard does the surface exert on the car referring to the normal force exerted by the ramp on the car and that is the normal force f sub n and that is just simply equal to the difference between the y component of the weight or wy minus the y component of the tension t or ty the fact that uh, these are the only two forces directed along the y axis and for the car to remain in equilibrium along the y axis this is our equation f normal is equal to wy minus ty substituting we get 1.01 times 10 to the fourth newton minus 0 0.282 times 10 to the fourth uh, newton All right so uh, Our answer for this would be F normal is equal to 7.28 times 10 to the third power Newton. We're now down to our last question, problem number six. In the figure shown below, the mass M1 is equal to 20.0 kilogram and the angle alpha is equal to 53.1 degrees. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block M1 and the incline is mu k equals 0 0.40. Question is, what must be the mass M2? 
of the hanging block if it is to descend 12.0 meters in the first 3.00 seconds after the system is released from rest. Okay, so in our diagram, there are two masses or two blocks. The one that is on the surface of the incline is labeled M1. And the one that's hanging has a mass of M2, right? So the combined masses M1 and M2 is what constitute the system, all right? So we are asked to determine uh, the value of the mass M2. Okay, the value of the mass M2, the one that's hanging, uh, so that uh, when the two masses are released, okay, from rest, what's going to happen is the mass M2 will start to move downward, okay, uh, moving a distance or vertical distance of 12.0 meter, okay, for a time elapse of 3.00 seconds. So, uh, in short, uh, the system will be accelerating in such a manner uh, that the M2, mass M2, is being moved downward, traveling a distance, vertical distance of 12.0 meters. And during uh, an elapsed time of 3.00 Seconds. So we will look at uh, our computation, okay, to determine the mass M2 in the next slide. All right, we start by identifying the forces acting on the two masses. So we have our vector diagram. First, for M1, of course, it has its weight, W. We label it here as W1, and that is directed, uh, of course, downward. So it has two components. Uh, the X component, which is labeled as W1X, and the direction of that, of course, is down the plane. All right? And the Y component, WY1, W1 or W1Y. It's directed uh, along the negative Y axis. By the way, we defined our uh, Cartesian coordinates. This broken line represents the Y axis. And of course, this one refers to the X axis. All right. So we also have the force of the rope. Take note that in the original drawing, the two masses are connected by a rope. And uh, the rope itself okay, is pulling the, uh, the mass M1 up the inclined plane. So that direction of T is up the plane. All right? So during the, uh, during the movement or the motion, there is a force of friction. All right? We label it as FK, meaning kinetic friction, in the opposite direction okay, of the motion of M1, meaning FK is directed down the plane. So both FK and the X component of the weight W1 are directed down the plane. All right? Uh, the force that uh, balances the Y component of the weight W1Y is, of course, the force exerted by the surface on M1, and that is the normal force, Fn. So these are the forces acting on the block number one, or M1, while for block number two, which in the original drawing, M2 is hanging, all right? So there are two forces only vertical forces 
acting on M2, its weight W2, and uh, the force tension capital T. Okay, so earlier it was stated that that the system are in fact undergoing acceleration. So as far as uh, M2 is concerned, it is accelerated downward, which suggests that W2 must be greater than the tension T. All right, and that the difference between them is what makes up the net force whose direction is downward. And that net force causes the mass M2 course to accelerate. All right? So from what was given, uh, we can determine the acceleration, okay? which incidentally is also the, the same acceleration for M1. But this time, M1 is being accelerated up the plane. So while M2 is accelerating downward, okay, because they are attached to a string, okay, the same tension that is exerted on M2 okay, is the same tension exerted on M1. But as far as M1 is concerned, this tension, T, is directed up the plane. Right? But as a system, uh, you will see later in our last part of our uh, solution, when we treat these two masses as a system uh, to determine if indeed uh, the value for the mass that we are going to compute okay, will come out to be exactly the same. So, we will first determine the weight W1. Since the mass is given, multiply 20.0 kilogram by the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8, we will get the weight W1 equals 196 newtons. And the x component of that weight W1 is just determined by multiplying 196 newtons by the sine value of the angle 53.1 degrees, so we will get 157 newtons. This is the x component of the weight W1, right? And for uh, the y component, W1y, multiplying 196 newtons, the weight, by the cosine value of the angle 53.1 degrees, will give us the value for W1y, which is 118 newtons. Now, we can say that uh, the normal force okay, exerted by the surface, the inclined plane, on mass M1, we call it F normal, that is just equal to the Y component of the weight W1. Okay, which is 180 newtons, the fact that they are the only two forces acting along the Y, okay, so they must be numerically equal in magnitude. Okay? We also determine the value of the kinetic friction Fk. Since we are given the coefficient of kinetic friction, multiply that by the normal force, and we will get as the value of the kinetic friction equal to 47.2 newton, okay? That is directed down the ramp. Now, according to what was also given in the problem, once the two masses are released from rest, okay, uh, M2 will be accelerating or will be moving from rest and it's going to move through a vertical height or distance of 12.0 meters through an elapsed time of 3.00 seconds. So, in short, from those information, we can determine the acceleration of M2 
which is incidentally is also equal to the acceleration of m1 all right but using that kinematics formula a is equal to twice the distance divided by the square of the time t if the initial speed is zero this is a working equation for acceleration okay we've learned this in our lesson on kinematics so substituting 2 times the distance d 12.0 meter divided by the square of the time 3.00 seconds squared we will get as the value for acceleration which is 2.67 meter per second squared so that is the acceleration of the two masses for m2 it will be accelerated downward and for m1 it will be accelerated up the inclined plane okay so we use the fact that um, the net force along the x I'm talking about uh, the uh, the first mass m1 all right uh, the net force acting on m1 we call it summation of fx okay is equal to its mass times the acceleration but the net force acting along the x on the mass m1 okay is the vector sum of t w1x and fk with their uh, signs already they're uh, emphasized so the tension t is directed up the plane so it's positive okay uh, the x component of the weight w1 is directed down the plane so it is negative and of course <coughs> the kinetic friction is also down the plane so it is also negative since what we are looking for is um, the the value of the tension t all right so uh, we first substitute t minus w1x which was earlier calculated to be um, what is w1x here w1x is 157 newtons while the kinetic friction fk is 47.2 for a total of 204 newtons all right so we combine the two quantities w1x and fk so that would mean t minus 204 newtons and that's equated to m1 multiplied by a since we already find or we have already determined the value of acceleration so simplifying so that we will get the value for the tension t okay we just transfer 204 newtons to the right side of the equation and add that to the product of 20.0 kilogram by the acceleration 2.67 meter per second squared all right so we get the value for uh, the force t equals 257.6 newtons and since that tension t or the force of the rope is the same force also exerted by the rope on mass m2 all right so as far as m2 is concerned the net force okay the net force acting on w2 or on mass m2 is equal to the difference between w2 and the tension t but w2 is expressed as m2 multiplied by g or 9.8 meter per second squared minus uh, the force tension t and that is equal to the mass m2 multiplied by the acceleration a so substituting or rearranging the form the equation uh, we will be able to get this okay as our uh, equation 9.8 meter per second squared multiplied by m2 all right we just move m2a to the left side 
so that we can factor out, all right, we can factor out M2, then equate them to the tension T. So our next equation shows that we just factored out M2 so that we can express okay, the difference in the acceleration, 9.8 meter per second squared, minus the value of the computed acceleration A, which is 2.67 meter per second squared. So when this difference in the acceleration is multiplied to M2, that's exactly is equal to the force of the rope T, or 257.6 newtons. Simplifying further, we will be able to get the working equation for determining the mass M2, and that becomes 257.6 newtons divided by 7.13 meter per second squared. This is the result of getting the difference between 9.8 and 2.67 meter per second squared. In short, the value of the mass M2 is equal to 36.1 kilogram to three significant digits. All right? So, we just answered uh, the question, which is determining the mass of the hanging block. 36.1 kilogram. In the next slide, before we end, I will also be uh, showing you a second method. Okay, uh, the second method to show that the mass M2 is indeed equal to this value, 36.1 kilogram, and that second method will uh, require us to consider the two masses as a combined masses, meaning as a system. So we will look at that in the next slide. So to show you the second method of determining M2, we'll still be considering what we already have calculated uh, in our first method, all right? So all of this, we'll be needing them. The second method, or method two, to find M2, we just consider or treat the two masses as a system, all right? So as a system, this is our key concept, all right? We say that as a system, um, the net force acting on them, on M1 and M2, that's labeled here as summation of Fx, is just equal to the sum of the two masses, M1 and M2, multiplied by a common acceleration A. But we will now express uh, the product all right, the product of M or the mass by the acceleration in terms of the weight. All right, so this equation can also be uh, expressed as summation of Fx is equal to weight W2. That is the force of gravity acting on M2. All right, and the fact that the system is accelerating vertically down or up the inclined plane, it is logical to say that the pull of gravity, W2, must be greater than the two opposing forces. What are they? Uh, the x component of W1, labeled as W1x, and the kinetic friction, Fk. So these are the only two forces, all right? that seem to oppose the pull of gravity, W2. Did you get that? We are only interested, okay, we are only interested on the forces acting on the two masses, okay, that comprises the net force, causing the system to accelerate 
Okay, vertically down as far as M2 is concerned or up the plane as far as M1 is concerned. Alright? Since the, the fact that the two bodies or masses only have the same common acceleration, alright? So we are able to say that the net force summation of fx is just equal to the difference in uh, the forces being considered. Alright? So this is the uh, the key concept okay, for our uh, for our computations. So there is really a need for you to understand okay, the principle behind this equation. Alright? So, instead of W2, we now express W2 in terms of M2 and G. Okay? Or acceleration due to gravity. That is what represents W2. While W1x is already, has already been determined, which is 157 uh, newtons. Alright? And the kinetic friction, which has also been determined earlier, 47.2 newtons. So this M2 multiplied by G minus 157 newton minus 47.2 newton is what is expressed in this equation. Okay, W2 minus W1 X minus F X or FK I should say. And they comprise what we call the net force acting on the system. That is why Okay, this is equated to the product of the two masses, 20 kg for M1 and M2 for the hanging block, all right, multiplied by common acceleration A. In short, this equation is just expanded into this form, all right. And when we proceed, that's now simple algebra, all right. So we just transpose. Uh, notice that 20 kg plus M2 okay, with a quantity, meaning they will each be multiplied by the acceleration A. But we want M2A to be transferred to the left side of the equation so that we can factor out M2 and eventually just have the quantity M2 on one side of the equation since that is what we are looking for. So, okay, this is how the equation will look like, okay? We just transferred M to A to the left side of the equation and then factor out M2, all right? That means M2 is just, I mean, uh, M2 will just be multiplied by the difference of 9.8 meter per second squared minus 2.67 meter per second squared. This is the value of A. And then, uh, minus or negative 157 and negative 47.2 are added and transferred to the right side of the equation, which is equal to positive 204 newtons. And the product of 20.0 uh, kilogram times A is 20 point kilogram multiplied by 2.67 meter per second squared. So in our in this equation, we are only left with one unknown variable, and that is m2. So isolating m2, we will have this working formula for m2. Okay, 53.4 newtons plus 204 newtons. All right, 53.4 newtons. Is of course the product of 20 kilogram multiplied by 2.67 and added to 204 newton. That's what is meant by this. Divide them by the difference in the acceleration, 9.8 minus 2.67, which is 7.13 meter per second squared. And finally, we get the value for M2 to three significant digits. We get 36.1 kilogram. The same value as what we got in our first uh, method of analyzing the problem.
So the second method considers the two masses as a system. Okay? And if you notice, in the second method, uh, the variable T, or the tension of the rope, is not included in our equations. Because when we treat the two masses as a system, okay, this tension force, uh, this kind of appear as an internal force already, internal force of the system. Hence, it's no longer included in our uh, equations because these uh, quantities included in the equations are forces that are external to the system. All right? While the tension force K, uh, consequently becomes an internal force. Hence, it doesn't appear in our computation using the method method 2. Alright? So, we are done with our uh, discussion or tutorial. Thank you very much for your indulgence.